Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining today's second SANS Pipeline webcast. Um, if you caught the first one, um, can't wait to catch it up. Uh, but welcome and thank you for being here. So as Laura mentioned, we're going to talk about setting, setting the gold standard for getting our operating system images that we're using in the cloud up and running, secured to what makes sense for us. So with that, I'm Ben Allen. I'm currently a cloud security architect at SANS. Um, my main focus is on infrastructure code and security things, uh, but I have worn many hats throughout the years from doing development and um, policy work to networking and storage and IO analysis. Um, one of the instructors for 540 and 534 and my contact info is below. You'll be able to catch it in the slide deck uh, that gets posted after the end of the webcast today as well. So here's what we're going to cover today. Four big chunks and break it down. We'll look at the big picture, figure out how we want to approach this, dig into the details to get one change that run through our results and figure out where we're going to take it from there. So from the big picture, First question that sometimes comes to mind is, do we still need OS images? And it's, it is 2021. We've got serverless, we've got containers and orchestrators and Kubernetes and functions of the service and that. Do we really need an OS? Like is, have we not progressed past that already? Well, there, there are still workloads that just have not been refactored to be cloud first, cloud native. And there's some things that just don't fit that model particularly well. So we still need to have an OS that we're gonna run and maintain, might be on-premise, could be in the cloud. We still need that OS. Um, the other factor for why do we need OS images rather than just starting from what the vendor has provided to us, vendor defaults remain very, very focused on having users download their Ubuntu image, ISO, way back when, launch it and start getting something of value out of it. So that usability, that minimizing time to value tends to take precedence over security or alignment with policy. Uh, in the critical security controls, uh, and for prepping for this, I was referencing version seven. I realized version eight is just on the cusp of coming out. Um, version seven, critical security control number five was setting a secure configuration for your servers. It is part of what's referred to as the basic control set, which is controls one through six. And within there, the second piece for how to maintain a secure configuration is to set secure images. So a widely accepted, uh, well-reviewed, benchmark of the critical security controls has this in there fairly early on as, as the size and scope of that uh, program is framed. So with all those benchmarks, what is the gold standard? And the fun cheap one here is there isn't a gold standard. At least there's not one that fits every organization out there which is kind of the standard IT answer of, well, it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, if you're processing credit cards, you have a requirement to be compliant with PCI. If you have medical records in the US, HIPAA, so on and so forth, you, your organization may have specific encumbrances, if you will, specific requirements that you need to meet for your customers to operate within the realm of legality of where you're currently operating. If you're in um, US federal government space, uh, and I'm, I believe other governments would have similar programs where you need an authority to operate like FedRAMP or the DISA state group, you may have some fairly rigorous benchmarks that you need to meet. And there's community find ones like I mentioned before, the CIS has both the critical security controls. They also publish a large number of benchmarks for specific technologies like 
the Ubuntu operating system or Windows operating system or Apache or Nginx or Kubernetes. So you have a, hey, here's a list I can check against. Taking those and any of those prescriptive lists straight from the publisher may or may not fit with the realities of your organization. So as we go through and figure out how we wanna set this standard and define it, we wanna be cognizant that we will need to adjust it for the realities of our organization. So we keep an eye out for that down the road. And as we do that, that's gonna affect how we set up our systems, how we set up our infrastructure. Um, I can remember before configuration management really gained weight, having a conversation with a system administrator who wanted to get the second server to be the same as the first. And the preferred approach was both systems have mirrored OS drives. Let's break the mirror on one, take this drive out of the one that's in the state we want it to be, and we'll put it in and we'll make it the primary drive in the new machine, change the host name and a few other things. And then we have two identical machines. Identical is not necessarily repeatable. It is not the desired state necessarily. It's just the same as the other one. As we move forward and develop or adopt some of these development focused practices where we're putting our configuration, our desired state goes into code, we can repeatedly get the desired state again and again and again. And we won't have to buy more and more disks to put in the servers so that we can clone more and more systems by mirroring and breaking mirrors. Many of things of, of those benchmarks also have uh, configuration code. So you can say, I can like to measure the CIS benchmark and I'd also like to apply this configuration against it. There's a group, uh, I believe it started out at Deutsche Telekom and now it's kind of spun, their, spun off on their own threads called dev-sec.io. Uh, they published a whole bunch of so these pairs, if you will. They'll have a assessment. Here's the benchmark defined with uh, inspec and we'll dig into inspec a little bit later. So here's how we measure it. And then here's an implementation to apply those controls using Chef or using Puppet or using Ansible. So you can then go back and forth. I want to measure against this, implement this, and we can get to parity with the specification through code that's available. If you want to go much further down that road, the Systems Integrity Management Project, or SIMP, from the NSA has got a set of puppet modules which go to, like, you can build classified ready authority to operate systems with open source software that the NSA has published and shared with the world. Uh, the NSA is not really known for sharing a whole lot. So that, if you're in that space, is a very good resource to keep an eye out for and take a look into. So when those the DevSec.io project writes their benchmarks and how to measure is a system in specification, within specification, we're using a tool called Inspec, which was written by the team at Chef. And it provides a way to describe this desired configuration state in a language that's, it's fairly readable for humans. You could train an auditor to walk through and understand, like, as I look at this section here of my metadata around this control, I go, oh, okay, yep, I can see on my checklist, server protocol must be SSH version two. I can pair that up with this control and then the description of that control at the machine level, machine readable part of it, describes how to verify it in a way that can be executed by the computer. So 
in that sshd config file the protocol should equal two pretty straightforward very simple very small example but many of these controls in these checklists are very specific and very narrowly defined as we pick through and build up this library your inspect tests can become your compliance requirements and that is immensely handy since we can run those inspect tests again and again and again and again and we gather all the results present them into a report and it's no longer a scramble to go work through a thousand checklists or a thousand items in a checklist and make sure that we got it done right the computer can do that in very little time let's see how little time um, we'll take a quick look here at window with my VM here, <clears throat> switch over and get out of the screensaver. And over here in EC2, uh, I earlier today launched, <clears throat> excuse me, an Ubuntu VM using the latest available upstream image from the vendor. So I'm going to grab its IP address and jump over to my terminal. I also have downloaded the SSH baseline from devsec.io to perform an, an inspect test on that VM. So we'll clear the screen here. Back in my command history. <clears throat> and we're going to pick this command apart a little bit later, but uh, in spec, we're going to execute the SSH baseline and we're going to set up some stuff about what are the SSH keys, the user, how do I get in there? And we're going to output a couple of reports. Paste that IP address in there. And when I do that, in spec is going to use the keys, connect via SSH to that server and go run. All right. It can do the work faster than I can explain it. This is a good thing. It's going to go run through all those tests and assess the system compared to that devsec.io SSH baseline. When we look at the results of that, we get a kind of clumsy web page. Um, but Inspeco put out some other output formats as well that can help us work through things and, and integrate into our uh, sort of software development style lifecycle a bit more smoothly. So we can see here up in the top right, 110 individual little controls were checked. Six were pending, so they got skipped, 59 failed, and it took a little over a second to do that. So as you get to a bigger and bigger control library, to take a minute to do an assessment would be what we're in, in the range of five to 6,000 controls potentially, that becomes much more manageable. As we look through here and see what some of these failures look like, I bet we can find, uh, maybe we won't go searching finding for it. Uh, look here, so the expected port should be equal to 22 for the SSH service. In this case, it said expected 22, but got nil. This just means it wasn't set in the config file, but that also means that when whichever SSH server is installed changes its defaults, we're going to accept them unexpectedly. That's not a really great state to be in for having a managed configuration on our server. So that gives us a quick, quick taste of what is this going to look like with inspec, what are the results we get. So let's take a look at what the approach is going to be for getting to a gold standard image. We're going to start simple and 
by simple, I don't mean that all of this is easy work to do. I think simple as in we're going to scope our problem to something that's small and tractable. And we'll iterate on it and we can expand the scope of this over time. We'll keep our focus nice and narrow, starting with the SSH service for a host that we're going to launch out into the internet and that will be our primary mechanism to interact with it is a very good place to start. It's one port, it's one well-known service, we can get it nice and scoped in. So we wanna get a reusable base out of it. And even if we're planning to do have long lived instances where we're going to manage them in an ongoing way, we still wanna minimize our launch time. So if we can get as close as possible to preferred desired configuration state for an ongoing long lived machine, out of the gate, that saves us time. And we, since we pay AWS by hours consumed, if we can trade storage for runtime to just get a machine set up, that can be a good thing for us. We also wanna integrate the verification of compliance with our process. And we'll pick that apart as we go through. So this workflow is gonna look like we're going to launch an instance from, from that upstream vendor, assess its configuration, then apply our desired configuration state. We want to catch the before configuration as a point of reference so that we can see if the vendor's getting to pass more controls or fail more of those controls over time. We're going to enforce that they're in the state we want them to be regardless but it's good to keep an eye on our, our supplier, if you will, and see if their quality of goods is moving in the right direction. When those assessments completed after applying the desired state, we can then choose, do we fail this build and say, no, that something's wrong here. Our configuration code didn't get us to meet our standard. We're not gonna make this, we're not gonna capture this image we're going to fail, let people know, and we'll come in and figure out what's going on. If everything passes and it's good to go. We we'll capture that image, capture the, result, the resulting assessment data, and publish it internally to say, hey, here's the latest SSH Bastion host image, for example. There's going to be a lot of pieces involved in this, um, but we're going to automate it pick things together. So we're gonna put our source code for our inspect profiles, Ansible, playbooks, some other code on how to do the configuration into a Git repo. For the examples here, we're gonna be using GitLab. We're gonna use Jenkins to orchestrate a bunch of this work, uh, pulling things from GitLab, launching Packer, having those things run, collecting the results and being able to report on those. Uh, I mean, part of this is based on these are tools available in the SEC 540 VM. So we're building upon those. The concepts are interchangeable. If at work, you prefer to use AWS code build or concourse or GitLab actions or sorry, GitHub actions or GitLab CI runners, we can switch out any, any of these components. Packer is gonna be doing the heavy lifting. It's gonna be responsible for launching our EC2 test image, capturing the image when it's done, running the inspect tests to assess the configuration, and then also running Ansible to perform that configuration management of this temporary instance we're gonna stand up. So high level, this is generally the flow. We'll start here, we'll make a little tiny change to code as the DevSecOps engineer. It's going to go into GitLab and uh, I don't know if Eric's watching, but I kind of skipped some of the things he did to harden GitLab before. If you want to check out the more uh, strict way as you're getting mature with this, Eric's webcast from last week about how to secure your version control pipeline is an excellent talk. Um, think he's going to have words with me for skipping some of those things after this. So we go through, we get our features into the main branch. 
and that will tell Jenkins start a build. Uh, for our purposes today, we're going to be pretty light on the analysis stuff, but when we get into Packer, the, the meat of this is going to be building a Phoenix server, running some acceptance tests, building a gold image, running those inspect tests again to make sure we're compliant, and then publishing it to AWS into our own account for our use later. <laughs> and the, the asset we're going to publish is an Amazon machine image. There's lots of them available in the AWS marketplace. Uh, people can publish them. You can publish them and share them with the community. You can sell your AMIs and maybe earn some profit on having an AMI that's desirable because it has certain characteristics. We'll dig into the details of this. Um, first, I go by example. So we'll go back to the VM here. And inside here is part of the Ansible config. This is the global set of variables. And for the hardening configuration from devsec.io, we're going to override a few things that are in here. And for the purposes of this demo, we're going to update some code here to say pipelines are spectacular until they fail. So we'll just add a little text to these banners. And this is going to flow through. Now, the point of this change is really immaterial aside from going to do it in Git so that it goes in gets tracked, and we can see the end-to-end -end process of when we change one line of code, what does it look, what does it take to get it out to production? So we've edited our global variables. We're going to add that to the get staging area. We're going to make a comment on this, that this is a feature, update the banner, webcast, and we're going to commit that code. And then we're going to push it to GitLab. And when we do so, close these old results, GitLab is going to send that information over to our gold build pipeline and start a build. As you can see, piecewise here, going through, it's going to check out the code, make sure credentials are good, go through. Now, this building the gold image is going to take around 10 minutes. Um, so we'll take a quick look. Here's the visual side of it. In the Jenkins file, we've got these stages. So that whole pipeline definition is also code, or if you prefer, it's a text file in a Git repo somewhere. And we can check things like, hey, when we can we connect to Vault and get our credentials? I'm doing some very light static analysis, if you will, here where we check that our inspec profile is up to date and valid. Check that our Packer configuration is valid. So it's some very quick. We don't want to bother trying to launch an image if we know Packer's got a bad config line in it or a missed curly brace or something like that. So we'll do these pre-flight checks. And then building the image is that Packer command. And we'll pick these apart a little bit further later. Um, we'll grab those build artifacts, whether it succeeds or not. So if it fails, we still want that data and we want to understand why. So let's dig into this a little bit further while that's running. I'm going to build this notion of a Phoenix test server. Right? Spins up, does its thing, we burn it down, and next time we pick up the ashes and bring another one to life, and it just keeps getting recycled. Oftentimes, this is done to like you stand up the full application environment, run your load test on it and then throw it away so you can say, I've got this repeatable starting environment. 
we're going to build the base layer for that and repeatedly build this image. We're going to stand up a new machine, configure it to our liking, and then we're going to capture that image, publish it somewhere, and next time through, if we want to build a full application stack, we have a base that meets our needs. And we can use that published image and get through that cycle time a bit more quickly. Mentioned we're going to use Packer for performing that image creation work. It's an immensely flexible tool. If you don't happen to run your stuff in AWS, it supports Google, it supports Microsoft Azure, it supports Alibaba and DigitalOcean and VMware. It has got a lot of flexible support. If it doesn't have one, it's open source. If you need to create a custom driver for your platform, there are good examples out there. It uses the same configuration language regardless of the platform. So whatever you're learning how to do can apply and shift over. And for some parts of it, you can just reuse whole songs of the template. Provisioning an Ubuntu VM, whether you get the source from Azure or AWS or Google's library of Ubuntu VMs, it's still an Ubuntu VM, so the same template will work. So what does this look like? Um, so we're going to start from a source. Packer takes the source, and we do some stuff, we can capture the output, and we create our new image. Rather than specifying a specific AMI in AWS, I'm going to go through and say, hey, find this owner ID, which means then we know it's coming from the canonical team who publishes Ubuntu. And we're going to go look for an AMI that matches the name Ubuntu images, HVM star, etc., etc., etc. One thing to note in here, in this particular case, is that server dash star, when Canonical publishes their images, includes a date. So if we were to run this a couple weeks from now, we are likely to get a newer version. As they apply patches and small incremental updates upstream, we will need to keep repeating this so we can get a current version And because that can match so many images, there's a handy filter in Packer to say, just give me the most recent one of these. I don't want to have to pick any more. I don't want to be, have to be any more specific than give me the most recent Ubuntu 1804 server image. That gets us a, a good starting point. After we've picked our source, we go into the build process. Now, on line two, you'll notice that the specifications for source says uh, plural. We can have a source for AWS and a source for Azure and a source for on and on and on for all the various ones that Packer supports. And once that source instance is online, we can use the exact same steps to do the build. And those steps for the build are running what are referred to as provisioners to do some pieces of work along the way and sort of term or truncated for some readability here show some that we're going to pick through in the code examples a little bit further uh, a shell local which runs on the instant the host where packer is running shell on the other hand runs in this phoenix server that we have just launched and spun up benefits for using either we use both. Um, there's a file provisioner. So if you need to have some binary object and you need to get the right desktop background for the corporate Windows VMs that you're launching, you can just upload files. And then there's a provisioner, in this case, for Ansible, for doing the configuration management. There are other configuration management provisioners as well. We're going to use Ansible today, uh, largely because it doesn't need a whole lot of footprint on the VM. 
And then the post processor for auditing this workflow and being able to attach information along the way of what happened when and where did it come from, the post processor plays an important role here. We're going to generate a manifest that's going to get captured in our Jenkins build. And with the Jenkins logs and data in that manifest, we'll be able to associate a git commit where we made a change with the AMI that was that resulted from that build, which gives us a really solid traceability. Mentioned Ansible has a light footprint. Uh, doesn't need to have an agent installed on the machine. It needs Python. OK, a lot of systems include Python by default. If not, we can install it with Packer beforehand to make sure Ansible will run. Uh, the configuration scripts are broken into playbooks and roles, and it's written in YAML. There are a large number of roles available from the Ansible Galaxy Hub. So if you need a, here's how to configure Nginx or SSH, there are lots of examples out there. The devsec.io team also happens to publish their secure configuration templates for a number of things using Ansible. If you need enterprise support, uh, Red Hat will have you covered there as well. So we're going to expand that build section a little bit and look at this Ansible provisioner. So we're going to run this default playbook, which is just a, another YAML file. And we're going to set some environment variables here. One notion to keep in mind here, since Ansible can run anywhere you can SSH into your members of your fleet, the Ansible if you will, main node or controller will often keep an inventory of what hosts has it learned about and keep up with how do I define my fleet. We're going to throw that away because we know this system is going to be launched, configured, captured, and thrown out. So we don't need to keep the inventory. We can pass in, pass in environment variables, extra arguments. And with the extra arguments, we can adjust the Ansible command completely to our liking. When we get to the Ansible playbook, again, YAML, not a terrible surprise for anything uh, DevOps related. We get a name that hosts all on line two, we can filter based on our inventory. In this case, we don't need to. Let's run this on every host we targeted at. Become tells Ansible, hey, when you connect to this machine, you're not going to have admin privileges. So you'll need to become a privileged administrator using whatever facilities are common for the OS to do that. Just go ahead and take care of it. Uh, line six has that global variables file. We edited that to launch our pipeline. So that can contain variables to override things or configure the behaviors of all the things further down in the Ansible playbook. We can bring in collections and dev-sec.hardening is the hardening collection from the devsec.io team. And it includes a role on line 10 for SSH hardening. So we've defined the collection on seven and eight, and we've brought it into our playbook to say, yes, use it on lines nine and 10. And then we can take tasks to go customize, place those banners we define in the global variables. We can do some additional customization based on the OS. And using those facts that are gathered on line four, we can control the flow of what happens in our playbook based on various aspects of the machine itself. For example, if you're running on an EC2 instance that has a GPU attached, maybe you would install some additional drivers. The GPU presence will be something that'll show up in the facts. And then you can use that fact later in your playbook to make those decisions about what to install. 
inside Packer, when it's time to run that inspect test, we're going to use that shell local provisioner. And we'll just give it an inline script. And so lines three through 10, the lines three and 10 are the HCL way to specify a multi-line string that will get joined with spaces. Um, some multi-line strings let you join with new lines. In this case, spaces are important rather than new lines, uh, but the syntax is, is there to support both. It's very similar to what we did in the command line. We're going to execute our gold standard this time rather than the upstream DevSec hardening, SSH hardening standard. We're going to run our gold standard. We're going to use the key files and target this machine that Packer just launched in the build. When Packer launches it, it's going to set up temporary keys, and we can use those by using that inline uh, provision, using the shell local provisioner. We can get access to those and grab those keys. And then we're going to output our reports. After, just indicates, as I mentioned, we're going to run inspect before we do the Ansible run, and then after. The change to run this before is just changing that output name from after to before. So run through, nice family tool, we get our output, and we can move along. There's a lot there in those layers. So we kind of pull back one step from what Packer is doing. We've got this command for that Jenkins will run in the Jenkins file, and that pipeline as text. It's going to run Packer build. We're going to define a safe cider that Packer will use for allowing SSH connections inbound to this temporary machine. And it's going to be just our IP address where Packer's running. We're going to put some version and build tag information in there so that when Packer runs, it can take that information from Jenkins and put it into that generated manifest, put it into comments and attributes on the image that gets created. So we have that traceability and that connectivity all the way through. So now we've seen the details. Let's see how all this fits together and runs through. Again, piece by piece, we're taking the small steps. Uh, this happens to be a sizable collection of small steps. Uh, let's see how that all works out. So we're going to take a look at that pipeline, see what the results were before and after, and take a look at what's going on with that manifest. So back to the VM and clearing its screensaver. Let's take a look at our Jenkins pipeline. Number 14, successful all the way through. So let's look at that build in detail. Take a look at that manifest. Um, that's... So we gave it a name. We've got an explicit run from Packer. And here's the AMI that was generated. Excellent. We, <laughs> we also can see the source AMI that it came from. And in this case, it was one created on May 8th, if I'm reading that right, 2021, 0508. Yeah, so there's that date stamp that this is, these upstream vendor images are getting updated regularly. So we can see the AMI and the name that we pulled from upstream. And we built ours and we called it DM Ubuntu Gold 2021, 0513, 14 is this execution number from our Jenkins build pipeline. So we have that connectivity back and forth between Jenkins and our AMI nice and clean to go figure out, OK, how what happened when this image was built? Just some great traceability. I'm going to capture this AMI real quick and go over here to the launch instance wizard. And in my account, I Got some AMIs. And let's just search for that one. And we can see here 
from build 14, UTC times 1630, 1623, which a clock in the top right corner says was within the last 10 minutes. So we'll launch one of those. I want to keep 14. details. I'm going to put this in a VPC where we can get public connections. And we're going to edit the security group to just say from my IP. So we don't need the whole world. And we'll use the webcast key. So this is going to launch in the background and we're going to, well, that spins up, take a little further look at what happened in our pipeline. There we go. So we can see the test results. Um, go there. 101 tests, no failures. As we look at the history, we can see a trend graph that says, hey, like a few builds ago, there were some tests that got skipped. Some of those, if you remember on the initial, there were some that were pending, not yet implemented, or excluded because of conditions. We can change, we can customize that inspect profile to say, these don't run anyhow, we'll skip them and pull them out so they don't count against us, if you will, as skipped tests. And our builds have been stable with 101 passing tests. The Jenkins interface has two versions and the Blue Ocean version gives us maybe a more appealing visual representation of the pipeline. Uh, it also handles attachments to or artifacts associated with the build a little bit differently in a way that helps us quite a bit for looking at HTML files. So let's look at the before HTML open up with Firefox and we see a fairly familiar, we've got 100 examples, 57 failures. I notice that that six pending are now gone because we've customized this profile a little bit. Go back here, we can look at the after as well, which is a bit more delightful. We now have an assertion that says, for this inspect profile and our measurement of what it means to get to a compliant build, our build pipeline completed and passed all tests. Everything's green, nothing was skipped. Good. We now have this artifact that we can use to associate with our audit trail. We again can look at that uh, information in the build manifest that's captured in the Jenkins log as well. And when we dig into the pipeline log, the other bit we get is the exact commit that was used for creating that image. So we can take that and jump back to GitLab and go find out exactly what was going on. So do this do there. And we're just going to replace that commit hash. And we will see that that commit contained our change saying pipelines are spectacular until they fail. So we've got that traceability from Jenkins GitLab all the way through. Let's take a look and see if our image or our instance here that's running has that in there. So we're going to grab that IP address. Quite the way I wanted to grab that IP address. Let's try this again. Copied. IP 
or user IP address. And when we connect, we can see that change has made it all the way through to this image we launched. Pipelines are spectacular until they fail. Brand new image. It's been up for about four minutes. We're good. We've got this traced all the way through. Make sure we got everything cover and we hit that manifest. The trend, as we look at this project, we get this nice little graph. As we grow beyond saying, okay, we've started with SSH because that's important and it's narrowly well-defined enough that we can start there and expand. As we add controls to this, we can watch this graph go up and increase in the amount of coverage, the amount of depth that we're getting in our testing and to sense the amount of richness we're getting in what we can do to build our controls and get known good for us images available to deploy things. So quick glance in case the demos were uh, not happy before and after, we can get to all tests pass. So quick wins here. We get those known configurations at launch. Being able to keep a configuration in a good state is a separate problem. It's definitely one that takes some effort and energy. But if you have, say, a spot fleet where you need to have something that's going to launch and every second you're running matters and you don't want to wait 30 minutes to have it check in get its configuration, reconfigure, reboot, check in again, get that all done. We want to have that built in, baked in at launch. So we launch it and start doing useful work. This is great for making our test configurations very much in line with production. If we're starting from the same base OS image or base application execution environment image, we're all we're doing, and all we're doing is <laughs> not necessarily easy, but where the difference between prod and testing is we might have got a slightly different version of code or might be running on slightly different size hardware, but we launched an instance and it's 99% exactly what we're using in production. That's a great step forward for being able to debug, reproduce, evaluate new configurations for production. And get those hardening policies out of the gate. We turn this image on, we've got SSH in a well-configured state before anybody has a chance to connect to it. We get rid of that race condition. And because we've got these audit policies written as executable tests, and we've got them traced through from our source code in GitLab to their execution, the results being captured in Jenkins, and the instance that was created or the image that was created all traced through. We have a very strong audit stance. We know what's in there. We know how it got there. And no, we did not have somebody go step in the middle of it and have to go flip through the three inch ring binder and check off each thing. Those tests were done in minutes and seconds. Because of that speed, we can expand that control set one piece at a time, keep iterating through, and we can get a large control surface implemented by starting small and iterating forward. that does still leave a long road ahead. There are substantial challenges with existing infrastructure. That system that nobody wants to power off for fear that the fans won't start spinning again, probably has no documentation or configuration policies or infrastructure code to define how to launch a new one. 
those will all take time and research and energy to identify what needs to be done. Taking that test first perspective of saying, hey, here's an inspect profile. Our use today was, is SSH configured correctly? But you can do so much more and say, does this respond to this request in the way I expected? And start getting the behavioral test of this old weird monolith system and compare it to the new one we're testing we want to replace it with that was built with code and build up a test suite to give us high confidence that we've taken this snowflake and made it into something we can now scale out and sustain and manage ongoing forever. And we can take those software engineering practices, put it in version control, standards, have peer reviews, protect your branches. Sorry, Eric, I skipped that one. Um, refactoring testing, we can do all that stuff and increase the speed at which we're making progress. And by automating it, we can do this again and again and again and again. And the computer doesn't get bored running the exact same instructions over and over and over again, not to the extent that well, at least I, I'm not a checklist first kind of person. I'll write them in code and let the computer do the checklist over and over. My personality type. But when we automate that, the computer can do them so much faster than a human as well. It gives us that opportunity for a much broader set of controls. So thank you. As I mentioned, Eric last week presented on uh, how to lock down GitFlow and protect that source of truth where that source code is for managing this process and keeping your uh, miscreants away from messing with your approved policies and built images. Coming up, Frank's going to be showcasing or doing a static code analysis showdown as well related to some of the brand new content in SEC 540. Uh, please come join us there as well. Uh, additionally, CloudSec Next Summit is coming up in under a month. So please join us live online uh, for two day free summit and a chance to take the new SEC 540 course coming up the following week. Uh, lots of new content, new labs. Uh, if you've taken the course before, uh, it has changed dramatically. Um, we would love to see you back again. And with that, uh, thank you for hanging out and spending an hour and see if we've got time for a couple of questions. Great job, Ben. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. We had one question posted, which was to share the links for part one and three of the webcast, which I just put in the chat. Um, you can, if you have already uh, registered for part three, but haven't, you've missed part one, you can register for that and you can go to the recording and the slides for that as well. Um, we don't have any other questions at this time. So maybe we give it a few seconds and see if anyone chimes in. And otherwise, Ben, you get the rest of your day free. <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you everyone for attending and thank you, Laura, for hosting and helping coordinate all this. Absolutely. And a couple of comments, just awesome presentation and great job. So thank, thank you, you all so much. And we hope to see you for part three in two weeks. Thank you, Ben. All right, thank you.